Lord, I thank you, Father, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit that breaks down every yoke of bondage. The Lord releases us to be all that you call us to be. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this special day. This is a day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice in your gratitude. It's not an option. It's a privilege to rejoice in you. Father, I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in me, what you're doing in Open Door Church, what you're doing in this nation. And Father, that you're raising up another generation. Lord, we call that forth right now. We thank you for the miracles that will happen, not only this week, but the rest of the year. Father, I believe that you're just lining them up right now like planes on an, at an airport to take off. And Father, they'll take off one at a time, one right after another. And so, Father, we release that and thank you, Lord, that we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, we say, God bless America. Amen. 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 Praise God. You be seated. Uh, I have a unique privilege this morning. You're going to have two messages. Yay. Uh, the first one is going to lead off. When I was uh, 26 years old, about uh, 46 years ago, I stood up here and preached my first message. Brother Jerry Croft was here, and I just love Brother Jerry. And Brother Jerry got sick in the hospital. There, and I helped him while he's in the hospital and did some other things. And he said, I hadn't got anybody for Sunday, but I got somebody. And I said, who's that? And he says, it's you, and you're going to fill in for me. And I came in filled in for a Pastor Jerry. I was nowhere close to as good as Brother Jerry Croft was. Uh, but it was an opening. My, I remember it distinctly because my wife was here, Miss Jackie, and she sat on the very back row. And she was shaking. She was afraid I'd get up here and make a fool of myself in that whole deal. She really was. And she was sitting in the back so she wouldn't be too embarrassed in that. But after I got through, I went back there and she said, I know you're called now because there ain't no way you could do that. And so she's right. And that's, that's the way it comes, but it starts somewhere. It starts somewhere. It really started years ago, years before that, when I was really about uh, 12 years old or 13 years old. Well, I was about 13 years old. And uh, uh, the pastor asked me to do a Wednesday night service, and I did that for him. Now, I didn't do much, but it was a start, and it was a beginning. So this morning, uh, I have got my granddaughter coming. And she's going to preach her first message to y'all. And so I, I told her, she says, uh, Paul, what if I go past 12? I said, Caitlin, me and you both have got to preach now, so let, let Paul in too. So this, but I'm believing for her. So, Miss Caitlin, would you come? And uh, thanks, thanks, thanks. Would you put out your hands? Father, I thank you for the anointing of God. That Samuel wasn't much more than this when you called him. And he heard the voice of God. And his words changed all of Israel. Father, I thank you for that same spirit, that same Holy Spirit that rested on him, that he comes to rest on her right now. Let her voice be the voice of God. Father, speak forth through her. And, Lord, I thank you for the anointing that rests on her as we release it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do good, babe. <laughs> thank you for the compliment. Okay. Okay, hi. How are y'all doing today? All right. I'm doing good, too, thanks. Um, so today what I'm going to be preaching about is what does a Christian mean? Or what does being one mean? Um, I have some friends at school, and they're like, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I go to church. You know, it's normal. Um, and, yes, they do go to church. You know, they pray and they sing, stuff like that. And then when they get to school, they act a total different way. Start cussing, start bullying, stuff like that. So I'm going to talk about what does being one mean. So start with 1 John 2, 3 through 6. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commandments. The man who 
says, I know you, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God love, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how he knows whoever comes and lives in him must walk with him. So, number one. Do we love Jesus? All Christians would love Jesus, right? They have a passion for him, and they have a place for him in his heart, in, in our hearts. Number two, do we love Jesus outside the church? Like I said, some of my friends love him in church, but not outside of church. Um, number three, does Jesus have our attention? Number four, does Jesus have your thoughts? Have you confessed what you've done so he may forgive you? Number five, do you have a long time with Jesus? Do you spend time with him? Do you pray with him every morning, every night? And do you obey him? He tells you to do something, do you do it? Do you keep his commands? Do you keep his word? Go to First John two three through five. It's basically the same thing. Mm-hmm. Do you live and look like Jesus? Basically, everything summed up. And then all these other verses that go along with everything else. John fourteen fifteen. If you love me, you will obey what I command. That goes along with, do you obey him? And John fourteen twenty three. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. And James two seventeen. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accomplished by action, is dead. Romans 6, 2. By no means. We died to sin. How we mm-hmm. And one first John 1, 8 through 10. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from the unrighteous, all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. And I don't know why I do this, I just do it, but fun fact of the day is, so you know how you always pray to him, right? It's the prayer that doesn't save you. It's who the prayer's going to that saves you. And I guess that's it. Yeah. What your life would look like. You know, uh, again, I was thinking as she said this, and this is uh, probably the uh, part that needs to go along with it. Uh, I, I was thinking about uh, how we, we off. Oh, it's, the camera's off. That's all right. It doesn't need to be on me anyway. Uh, have you noticed that uh, it's election season and everybody's a Christian? I was uh, listening this last week to a prominent uh, uh, governor uh, running for governor of the race and whatever, and uh, she said, uh, you know, I I come from a Christian family, and my dad is a pastor, and my dad and our church believe in abortion, and we want to say that the Bible says that it's all right to have an abortion. The only problem with that is she never gave a Bible verse, and I'm crying out, where do you find that? 
I can find a whole lot for life, but I can't find a whole lot for death. She just gave to you, if you are mine, you keep my commandments. Oh, anybody can say anything they want to say, but what matters is what you live out in your life. And God is calling us today to be people that live it out in our lives and to ask for our leaders, demand from our leaders that they live it out in their lives. That was, that was a tremendous message for your first time. I remember my first time, and I was scared, and I didn't hear a crack in her voice the whole time. So she's been given boldness, and I praise God for that boldness, and she's using it for the Lord Jesus. We were at uh, the Lion Chasers uh, the other night, and uh, uh, again on Friday night, and uh, while we were there, Joseph wanted to go with me, my little boy, and uh, I'm going to start calling him big boy because he wants to be big, so I'm going to start confessing for him. But he went with me to Lions Chasers, and he's there, and he's playing, playing on his game and the whole thing. And we get started in our lesson, and uh, Miss Cecilia, the Lord comes on Miss Cecilia, and she said, I got a word for Joseph. And said, Joseph, come over here. And he sat in her lap, and she prophesied over him. And uh, he was just listening. He wasn't playing with his game. He was listening the whole time. And he was sitting there in her lap, and she prophesied over the anointing of God that was coming on him and what he was called to do and all of that. And she got through uh, with that. And so he got up out of her lap, and he went over and sat down and started playing his game again. So you wonder what kids get sometimes. He's eight years old. And uh, so uh, we had to bug out early because we had to get him in bed at 8.30. So anyway, uh, we left, and we got home. And I went upstairs to change so I could get ready for bed. And Joseph's downstairs with Jackie. And when I came back downstairs, jo Jackie says, uh, well, I know everything that was said at Lion Chasers tonight. I said, you do? She said, Joseph told me all that y'all talked about. And she ta he talked about all the things that we were talking about and gave the points on it. And not only that, then he started telling what he had been prophesied over. Can I tell you something? We've got a generation that's coming that's changing and transforming the world. There's an anointing coming on them. For sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound. I praise God for these kids. I praise God for you. And I praise God for your grandkids. Oh, keep praying for them, keep ministering to them, and keep calling them to the Lord because God will change them. God will change them. And, Lord, I thank you, Father, for this morning. I thank you, Lord, for the way you've started us off. And Father, again, I thank you for Caitlin. I thank you for the gift of God that's inside of her. I thank you, Lord, as I'm reminded of Samuel again. And that, Father, none of his words fell to the ground. God, may that be the, that may that be the, uh, uh, the title of this nation and this generation, that none of their words fall to the ground, but they speak powerful life words in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. I want to remind you again that uh, Monday, tomorrow night, tomorrow night at 6.30, we will be on the hill and we will be praying for the nation. We're going to be praying. Uh, by the way, we still have uh, these up here. You say, what are we praying for? I want you to come and I want you to bring this because we're going to pray these things for our nation on righteousness and for our leaders and for transformation that's going to be going on in this nation because I believe that there is a transformation. We need it desperately. About um, three and a half weeks or four weeks ago, and I want to say this, I haven't said it yet, but I, I wanted to wait till today. I want to thank you for the gift, uh, the gifts that you gave me for pastor's appreciation. I appreciate that very much. But on that day, there was uh, uh, sur surprising things to me uh, as my daughter and uh, Miss Linda uh, gave me some gifts. And uh, this is one of them. I don't know if you saw them or not. These are the gloves. And when I got the gloves, I, uh, I looked at them, and I said, my, my, God's speaking a prophetic word. It's not for right this second, but I'm going to come. And so today, I'm going to speak to you about the gloves. I'm going to speak to you what they mean and what it means for this hour that we're in. These gloves are real gloves. They are uh, professional gloves. And Jackie, got, I, got, I got them home with me, and Jackie said, well, now you need to go to the gym, and you need to box at the gym. I said, Jackie, that ain't going to happen. I said, not only am I not going to box, but I said, these gloves are for special things because they are gloves that uh, are professional, 
And uh, they are the best gloves that are created for professionals. They're Everlast gloves. Uh, Jim, uh, J uh, J Jim Dempsey was the one that uh, came when pr boxing profession came out, and he was a champion. And he came out, and he says, i got to have some gloves that will last through all the rounds that we're fighting with. And so he got a sporting goods uh, company to make a special set of gloves, and those special set of gloves were called Everlast. And then uh, we'll go along with the message today. That one is Everlast, and this one over here is Evergreen. Uh, that, that is not the name of the boxing gloves, but Everlast and Evergreen. One is an Everlast glove, and one is an Evergreen glove. And I'm going to explain to you exactly what that means and what it's all about. It comes uh, as... Uh, comes from a book that I am very uh, familiar with and very fond of. I've spoken about some things that were in, and it's called uh, An Appeal to Heaven. An Appeal to Heaven. And it's uh, by Dutch Sheets. And Dutch Sheets has taken through, taken you through some years that God has put inside of him the love for this country and the dreams and the prophetic words that have been given about what's happening in our nation and what is about to take place in our nation. Can I tell you right now, there are some great things going to happen in this country. There are some great things that are going to happen in this country, and God's going to do, do great things right here. Let me move over here because i got to get something I forgot over here. Also, with those gloves on that day, I was also given this, and Miss Linda got this, Miss Krista got the other, and Miss Linda got this, and it is a key ring, and it's got boxing gloves on it, the same red boxing gloves that these are on there, and here's what it says on the key ring uh, with that. Jackie said, read what it says on the key ring. Thank you for being in my corner. We're thanking God that he's in our corner. Oh, well, we, what we're facing is impossible. It doesn't matter. We got the God of the impossibilities on our side. And I want you to realize there's more than just the natural happening around us. There's the supernatural that's happening. And God is in what's going on right now. God has known it all the time. It's time to use both of those gloves. Not just one glove, but both gloves. And God is going to show us when and how to do what needs to be done. And it's being done right now. Oh, well, someday. No, it's being done right now. And we need to pay attention to it. There are people that are still asleep. That's one of the things that's on this right here that I said to pray for this nation, that people will wake up and they'll turn to God and they will turn to God's church. Two things that need to happen and two things that will happen because they're on the move right now and God is in the midst of us doing those very same things. I'm going to take two scriptures and I'm going to read those to you and then we're going to get going and I'm going to share with you some things that Dutch has said in his book and that some things that God has spoken to me. Genesis chapter 21, Genesis 21, verse 22 through 34. We have the story of Abraham, and Abraham is making a covenant, a covenant that he cuts because he's favored with God, and the heathens around him recognize it. Can I tell you, we're coming into a day the heathens around us are going to start recognizing that we're favored of God. And he makes a covenant in Genesis chapter 21, verse 22. At that time, Abimelech, he's the king, and Philco, the commander of the forces, said to Abraham, God is with you in everything you do. Now swear to me here before God that you will not deal falsely with me or my children or my descendants. Show to me the country, uh, show to me and the country where you are living as an alien the same kindness I have shown to you. Abraham said, I swear it. And then Abraham complained to Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized. But Abimelech said, I don't know who has done this. You didn't, you didn't tell me. And I, I heard it about it only today. So Abraham brought sheep and cattle and gave them to Abimelech. And the two men made a treaty, a covenant. King James says, a covenant, a covenant. And Abraham set apart seven new lambs from the flock. And Abimelech asked Abraham, what is, the, what is the meaning of these seven new lambs you have set apart for themselves, by themselves? And he replied, accept these seven lambs from my hand as a witness that I dug this well. So that, that place is called Beersheba because the two men, Beersheba means the well of oath or the well or the living well, the well of oath. 
and it, so that that place was called Bathsheba because the two men swore an oath there. And after the treaty or the covenant had been made at Beersheba, Abimelech and Philco, the commander of his forces, returned to the land of the Philistines. And Abraham planted a tarmosh tree. Now I want you to realize, this is, we're, we're coming back to this. And Abraham planted a tarmosh tree in Beersheba. And there he called upon the name of the Lord, the eternal God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines for a long time. One other passage of Scripture. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 11. A familiar passage of Scripture for us. Solomon is dedicating the temple. He has prayed before the Lord, and the Lord gives Solomon an answer. And when Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and on his palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. And when I shut up, listen with this, and when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and will hail their land. Now my eyes, listen to the last part. Now my eyes, God says, now my eyes will be open, and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will always be there. Lord, I thank you that your eyes and heart are always here. Father, I thank you for this nation I thank you, Lord, that you have made us a city on a hill that send forth the light of the gospel. And I thank you, Lord, for fulfilling that promise and fulfilling all those promises that you made those that came before us. And, Lord, we bless it. We receive it. And, Father, we want to walk in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I've said this before, but I want to say it again. Remember, we have a godly heritage. We didn't come out of heathens. We came out of godly people. I don't care what this woke generation is trying to say and trying to propagate. All you have to do is look at the facts of history. This nation was born in a great awakening. The great awakening that happened actually in the later, latter parts of the 1600s and into the 1700s with a seedbed of freedom and liberty that went around the world that had never existed before. No nation on earth has ever existed like this before that propagates what? The freedom of God and also the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was in the covenants that were made with the pilgrims as they landed on Plymouth Rock. It was the covenant that was made with John Cook. It was the covenant that was made over and over again that God would bless this nation, that it would be able to carry around the world the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you, our wealth and our power has not been given to us so we can squander it on our own pleasure. God has given us a reminder, even in our days, that that's not what has been given to us. It's been given to us to show forth freedom and to take the gospel to the world. I was so excited when I heard Linda this morning, and she talked about her friends that I know very well in Russia right now. And she was telling me, she said, Pastor Rick, they said, get ready, because after this is over, Russia will need the gospel more than they ever have before. Get ready to come. Can I tell you, I'm ready to go. I believe God is calling us around the world. Why? Because he's going to open up areas that we've never seen before. He's going to even open up Muslim world. He's opening up right now. And there will be a place for us to go and proclaim the gospel. And I want to be ready for that. And I want us to be ready for that. But the first place it has to start is in our own homeland. We have got to come back to our own heritage. And we've got to remember where we came from. That we didn't come from heathen. We came from the godly. Over and over, I'm looking at the Scripture. I'm, I'm studying history and all the things. I've got a book that I think that Miss Cecilia gave me uh, all the way through that's got uh, the sayings of the founding fathers and their prayers and the Scriptures that they went by. Over and over, I'm seeing again and again that this nation started godly. We have not ended up there, but we started there. And God wants to restore that. 
And in that, I see over and over again that our nation was actually founded for this purpose of carrying the gospel. That 80%, listen, 80% of our colleges and universities that were started out, 80% of them were started out for one purpose, to train young men for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be carried around the world. Some of those institutions, like Harvard University, were started out as seminaries. Princeton University was started out as a seminary. They were meant to bring us into a training time where we could write what, what we, we could carry the gospel. But not only the gospel, but at that time there was a great awakening of the comp- country. There was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit like never before. The whole nation was affected. It affected not only the whole nation, it affected the leaders that were to step up to found this nation and to bring us into what we are today and to give us what we have. We have people like George Washington. We have people uh, like Benjamin Franklin. John Rush, many of them. Have, have people that stood up, that wrote our Constitution, that signed our Constitution, that were either preachers or that they were dedicated Christians who believed in what God was doing in this nation and what God wanted to do around the world. That's our heritage. That's where we've come from, and that's where God is bringing us back to. He's bringing us back to remember something, that our past matters. That what? Our past matters. Not, not just our future, not just our present. We've got a whole lot of people, especially in the woke community that just want to live in this generation and notice something they're real self-righteous well we're not going to have anything to do with our founder George Washington or all these founding fathers because they were all slave owners well they weren't and mo- many of them didn't even believe in slavery but this woke generation thinks they're better than everything else. Well, listen to me. I want to tell you something. The Bible says, judge not that you be not judged. By what measure you judge, you shall also be judged. Can I tell you? We live in a world and a country where slavery is more in effect than it ever has been in history. There are more slaves today than there ever has been before. And most of them are in slavery because of the woke generation. Because they want to buy their stuff that are made by slave trade. Are you listening to me today? See, it's easy to be self-righteous without God. Because we think we're better than everybody else. And we're not. Everybody we find in Scripture has fault in them. We want to say, well, them people were perfect. There are no perfect people. There was only one perfect, and his name was the Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham is the father of the faith. He is our father in the faith. But if you look at Abraham's life, Abraham wasn't a perfect guy. As a matter of fact, he probably wouldn't be accepted in this church right here because he failed in a whole lot of ways. Remember? He was a wife swapper and didn't even get one swap for his own self. Are you listening to me? How, what kind of guy that like that did you want in there? I want you to realize right now that Moses was a murderer. I want you to know that God looks at the past and he says, I've made a provision for the past and that past is to be forgiven. And God forgives men and women and he forgives nations. He's looking for a people that I just spoke about a while ago. Well, if my people, not, not the nation, not everybody, not the politician, but if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. Can I tell you, we've got people, his people, that have humbled themselves, that are praying, that are fasting. You know, you may not be looking forward to Tuesday, but I am. I'm ready to go back to coffee and tea and bread. And sweets. Okay, God, I'm going to measure it out. I'm not going to do bad this time, okay? I'm going to do better in what I'm doing. But I want to tell you something. It's a reminder. Every time that I want a cup of coffee, I'm reminded. Every time I want a glass of tea, I'm reminded. Oh, it's not something, oh, well, he, he's suffering. No, I ain't suffering. And, and you didn't either. But I want you to know it was 40 days of thinking about what God wants to do in this nation and asking him to do it. Every night when I'm getting, before I get into bed, I make sure that I sit down with this and I'm not going through it and just doing repeating. I'm praying through it. Why? Because I believe that God will exalt this nation again by rising, raising up righteous people. I believe that God is in the midst of us right now to start a revival. He's starting a change and a transformation. And that change and transformation starts with us. 
It starts right here. Stop looking at, oh, well, you know, if them heathen in Washington would get saved, you know, God's looking for us to get saved. He's looking for us to get right. And as we get right, he'll change everything around us. See, Abimelech and, and Philco, uh, they came to uh, Abraham because they recognized something. Not, not that Abraham, he was the richest man that ever lived. That wasn't what they recognized. See, Abimelech, if you go into the history, if you t uh, uh, turn a few chapters before that, you'll find Abimelech would, uh, had uh, Abraham's wife. You remember the story? He was the one, that king, that took in his wife into his harem. And God appeared to him at night and said, Boy, if you touch that woman, you're a dead man. And he says, he, he shut up the womb of all the women that was in his household that nobody could have any children anymore. He wouldn't even have an heir. God was going to shut it all off. And what happened? He repented. And the Bible says, this is the first time we ever find it in Scripture. The Bible says that Abraham was a prophet. And God spoke, or, or the king spoke to him and asked him to come and pray for him. And Abraham came and laid hands on the king. And the Bible says from the moment he laid hands on the king and he for, spoke forgiveness, that what? The king's women in his household, were, the wounds were open and their diseases were healed. Can I tell you something? God is bringing up a generation that's going to be recognized about the e but, uh, among the evil people that are here to let them know there's a difference between God's people and those that don't know God. And there is a big difference, a real big difference. In the, in the book, uh, we find that uh, 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 Dutch Sheets is uh, starting on a journey. And that journey starts, first of all, it, it's not in the book, but it does. In about 2001, God really came, came with a visitation uh, to Dutch Sheets. Dutch Sheets was a well-known uh, preacher and a conference speaker and all that. But uh, he was not into America and what God was doing in America. But God came to him, and he was in a prayer uh, uh, session with the Lord and God the Holy Spirit came on him and he said for four or five hours he just wept he was on the floor weeping he couldn't do anything but weep and he was asking God God are you going to kill me he said I thought God was going to kill me and he said God said no he, Jesus said no I just want to show you the heart that I have for America and I'm putting that heart in you and from this time forward it's going to change and you're going to be one of those that propagates through prayer and declaration throughout the nation a transformation and a coming back to Amer of America to their roots. And it started there. But it was a journey along the way. And the book is about his journey. And in that journey, he goes to his alma mater. He is an elder on the board. He is the, I think he's the chief operating uh, whatever it is uh, in the group. And he's been invited back, and they said, you know, since uh, Gordon Lindsay, he was the head of the um, Christ for the Nations, and Gordon Lindsay started that in the 70s, and it became a, a great uh, revival power. Miracle signs and wonders flowed out of it. They were training young people to go be missionaries and preachers around the world and all that was going on. And uh, since Gordon Lindsay had died, it kind of waned. And it was getting down, and they said, Dutch, we want you to come and speak and see if you can encourage our students and encourage and see if we can have revival again to bring back the fire that we once had. And so Dutch came, and he says, I was standing there, and it was a standing there to preach. He said, I had a hard time because he said, while I'm trying to preach the message, God is talking to me. And he says, have you ever tried to speak while somebody is talking in your ear? And said, God is talking to me. And he's saying to me, he said, Dutch, he said, uh, this generation is not going to change until they agree with the prayers of Gordon Lindsay, their founder, that he prayed. And Dutch says, I'm arguing with God while I'm trying to talk to these kids. And he says, I'm arguing to God. I said, God, Gordon Lindsay's dead. He, you know, you're not supposed to talk to the dead. You're not supposed to. He said, Gordon Lindsay is dead, but his prayers aren't dead. Listen to me. There are generations that's gone on before us that their prayers are not dead. They prayed for me. I had, I had great-grandmothers that prayed for me. I have my grandparents who prayed for me. I had my, uh, my mother and my dad who prayed for me. They, they, they agreed with God that I was called into the ministry. I was called in. Why? Because there were generations before me that had laid foundations. Can I tell you? God is wanting us to come in. He, the Lord spoke to him and said, I want you to come into the synchronizing of the nations. And he said, what in the world? 
He said, I've never heard that in the context of what you wanted to do, Lord, or, or, or in the context of anything that I've ever heard preached before, the synchronization of the ages past. And he said, yes. God spoke to him and said, yes. I, I want you to know that we're coming into synergy. What does synergy mean? It means multiplication of power through combined effort. We're, we're agreeing with those that have come on before us that we're in combined effort with them to do what God has called us to do. I want to tell you, we have been given a nation that is free today, a nation that's prosperous today, a nation that's powerful today. Why? Because of our forefathers that came before us. Did they make any mistakes? Absolutely. Just like Abraham did. Just like Noah did. Just like what? All the way through Moses, you have all of these people who make mistakes, but God is a God that gives forgiveness and transformation because God is working in a seed, a seed that he's synchronizing. Can I tell you, we didn't get here by ourselves. It started with a seed, a seed that was promised to Eve. She said, one day you'll have a seed that'll be born that'll crush the head of the serpent. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ that was coming. That seed was passed down from generation to generation through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob. It's interesting to me how important God sees generations. All the way through the Old Testament, we find genealogies where God lays out this one had this one and this one and this one. And I read them sometimes and say, God, can I just skip over that part? I can't even call their names. But God had a purpose for that. And then he comes into the New Testament, and you know what he starts in the New, starts the New Testament out? Genealogy. He starts the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ, where this seed came from. And it was godly seed, and it came from godly. Were there people that failed in there? Yes. He even put it in the genealogy. They didn't leave it out. They put Tamar, who had sex with her father-in-law. They put Bathsheba, who what? Who was in adultery with David. They had all of these women that had failed, all these men that had failed, but God brought them out and forgave them and brought the seed that we have out today. God planted a seed, a seed of Himself in this nation, a seed of Himself in this church. And God says, I'm not through with it yet. I had not completed it yet. And all of them behind you are still cheering. Can I tell you, I come up here sometimes to pray. And, and when I come up here, I hear the voices of the past. I, I even talk to some of them. There have been many times when I come up here, one of the main ones is Don Redmond. When I come up here and I see something that needs to be done and whatever, I say, where are you at, Don? I want you to realize right now, we didn't get here by ourselves. My, my f- grandfather actually came up here and they had an old tabernacle at the time. He was one of the elders of the church. And he came up here with an old pot-bellied stove in the wintertime. And he came up here before everybody else got up here to make sure there was wood in it. And there was heat for those that were coming to worship. Can I tell you, from generation to generation, God says, I'm going to have a people that praise me. Oh, well, this church is going down and it's going out. And God's people are going to disappear. No, it's not. The world will disappear, but God's people will never disappear. We're getting in line with those that came on before us. When I'm up here sometimes, I hear Hudson Young. You sit on this side of the, or right in the middle of the church over here in a pew. And he said, amen. Real loud. All the time. I remember Bill Johnson as being my Sunday school teacher. I remember those people that stood in gap. And they stood in the gap their whole life till they left this earth. They served God. Can I tell you, that's coming back to the church. And we're a part of that. You're a part of that. You're not here by accident. You didn't show up by accident. God knew when you would live, and He knew what would happen during your time of living. And God set it up for a Dutch sheet as He told him, I want you to synchronize the generations, and I want you to bring them forth, and make sure that those prayers and those dedications that were before you will be brought into this. Hebrews 12, verse 22. The Bible says, But you have come to Mount Zion. Listen, what it says, only Jerusalem, the city of the living God, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. You, you know they're here this morning, don't you? And the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven, you have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. 
Can I tell you something? There are generations that are going forth right now, and you may not believe this. People say all the time, well, I wonder if... Uh, uh, I, I wonder if so-and-so ever knew you became a preacher. I, I wonder if so-and-so ever knew that that person w gave their heart to the Lord. Can I tell you, I assure you, they did. Yes, they did. Yeah. The Bible says there's a great cloud of witnesses. What does a witness do? He watches what's going on. And the Bible also said that they never received what was promised to them. They never got the full re reception of it. You know why? The Bible goes on and, and says they were waiting on this generation. Yeah. For without us, they could not be completed. Could not what? Be completed. They could not come to maturity. There were many of them, like Abraham, Isaac, uh, uh, Isaiah, all the way through, that were given promises that they never saw fulfilled in their lives. You know why? Because God says, I'm not going to fulfill it in your life. I'm going to fulfill it in the life of the generations that come from you after you. I want you to know right now that you are exciting to people around you. Say, look there. There's my relatives. They're serving God. They're doing the ministry of the Lord. Why? Because there's a great a company. There's a great company of a cloud of witnesses that are watching and witnessing what is going on today. You know, can I tell you something? Miss Caitlin has just introduced it, and I, I just want to say that. It matters how you live. It matters who you live for. It matters why? Because... It's going on from generation to generation. I don't know if I've read this before, but I'm going to read it today. It's found also in Dutch Sheet's book. And it's about a Alan Sanders. I wrote a book, and it's called Crisis, uh, Crisis in Morality. And in that, he takes two men that lived at the same period of time. One is a, one is a heathen, don't know God, never known God, never will. And one of them is a godly man. Jonathan Edwards, who was a great preacher, writer, and minister in the Great Awakening. Listen to what it says. It talks, they went and researched their descendants, and this is what they found. Max Duke married an ungodly girl. And among their descendants were 310 who died as paupers, 150 as criminals, 7 as murderers, 100 as drunkards, and more than half of the women were prostitutes. John, Jonathan Edwards, who lived at the same time, very godly and married a godly woman, lived at the same time and married a godly girl, and an investigation was made of his descendants. Thir 1,394 known descendants of theirs, of these descendants, 13 became college presidents, 65 college professors, 3 United States senators, 30 judges, 11, 100 lawyers, 60 physicians, 75 army and navy officers, 100 preachers and missionaries, 60 authors of prominence, one a vice president of the United States, and 80 became public officials, and 295 college graduates, among whom were governors of states and ministers on foreign fields. Does it make a difference serving God? Yes. God says, I will show a difference between those that are godly and those that are ungodly. I want to tell you, that's the seed that God plants from generation to generation. And let me tell you something. The seeds get bigger and bigger and they grow larger and larger. Listen, if you have a theology that says we're going to get out of here by the skin of our teeth, you got the wrong theology. Because God says, before I come back, I'm going to have a church without spot or wrinkle and blemish. I'm going to have a church who serves me. That's the church we, I look for. That's the church I'm looking for and I'm believing for. Hear this right now. It's because of accumulated, because uh, we don't think about this. We think about, well, Mrs. C or Brenda or whoever, uh, we said some prayers early on in life. We prayed for our children. I prayed for this and, and whatever. And, and, and you know, we didn't see it at the time, but we, we don't know. Listen, Revelation chapter 8 reminds us something. No prayer is ever wasted. No prayer is ever ignored. They come from the godly. The Bible says in, in Revelation 8, he says he bottled them up. And the tears that go along with them when you prayed them. And I prayed some of those prayers. I prayed it for my children, my grandchildren. I prayed it for others. And I prayed those bottled up. And, there, and God says there's a time coming when he's going to call for the angel. An angel will take the bottle and he'll mix it with incense. And, he'll, and, he'll, and the incense will go up before the throne of God reminding him of all those prayers. And God says, I will bring judgment. 
I will bring righteousness. I will bring it back into alignment. Can I tell you, God never forgets your prayers. And he hadn't forgot the people's prayers that went on before us and those that prayed for us. God says there's a synergy that's coming to the ages. See, God wants to heal. He wants to heal the generation. He doesn't want to judge this generation. He wants to heal. Jesus said, I didn't come to judge the world. I came to forgive the world. In Isaiah chapter 58, verse 12, Isaiah speaks. He says, there's a time coming. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and raise up the aged old foundations. You will be called repairer of the restore with dwellings. God's going to heal the sin of racism that we've had in this nation almost from a very founding father. Well, that, that disqualifies. Listen, there is no nation on the world that's never had slavery nor discrimination. None. So why would that knock us out? It wouldn't. You know why? Because God forgave us. He did it at Calvary 2,000 years ago when Jesus hung on the cross. He did away, what? With all prejudice there. I'm going to read this to you, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14. It's out of the Passion Translation. I like this, and it says this. Our re reconciling peace is Jesus. Our reconciling peace is Jesus. Oh, well, if we can just get people right and agree with one another. No, no. Our reconciling peace is Jesus. He has made Jew and non-Jew one in Christ. By dying as our sacrifice, he has broken down every wall of prejudice that separated us and has now made us equal through our union with Christ. We're one in Christ Jesus. Ethnic hatred has been dissolved by the crucifixion of his precious body on the cross. The legal code that stood condemning every one of us has now been repealed by his command, his his triune essence has made peace between us by starting over. Starting over. Forming one new race of humanity. Jews and non-Jews fused together in himself. Two have now become one. And we have restored to, we've been restored to God and reconciled in the body of Christ through his crucifixion. Hatred died. Can I tell you, Jesus took all hatred on the cross and as He received it at Himself, He re released what? Peace and reconciliation. Can I tell you, I'm, I'm calling to a nation to say, we're coming into peace and reconciliation. I know the world that we're living in, the politicians that we have are trying to divide us. But God says there's one reconciling peace when we come into the Lord Jesus Christ and it, we realize that there are no two races, there are no three races, there are no races at all because we're one race in Christ Jesus. We are one in Him. God is raising up a new generation, a new generation that's going to see the oneness of God in the midst of his people. You know, the key thing is that we need to remember that God says that we can repent and that our sins will be forgiven. Our sins will be forgiven. Last part, let me wind down. These two gloves that I talked about. When the gloves were given, I immediately was reminded of the story that uh, Dutch has in his book. And, and the story in the book was this. He, uh, he was at a conference a few years later, about six years later, I think it was. He was at a conference. And when he was in a conference, uh, the Lord had already spoken to him uh, uh, about the passage of Scripture. And he didn't understand all of it. But anyway, God was kept speaking to him uh, about those things that were going on. And in this conference, uh, Dutch says, I was going up to my room after the conference. And he said, uh, I got on the elevator with uh, a conference uh, speaker who was a friend of mine. He never gives the last name. I don't know if that's purpose or not. But anyway, he said, a very good friend of mine, a conference speaker. His name was Rick. And he said, uh, Rick was a prophet and a dreamer. And he said, I got on the elevator with him, and I was just cutting up. And I looked at Rick, and he says, Rick, I need a word from God. How about having a dream for me tonight? And so they laughed about it, and he went upstairs and went to bed. He said, I got up in the morning, and he said, Rick came up to me, and he says, I had a dream about you last night. He said, you're kidding me. He said, no, I'm not kidding you, man. He said, you were in a dream. He said, me and you were in a dream. And said, in the dream, he said, you were a boxer. And you had all your boxing short on and all that, and you had your gloves. And he said, you were facing five rounds with five of the biggest giants that I've ever seen. And he said, you got in the ring, each ring, uh, each, each round, you got in the ring, and with, one, with the right 
And then with the left, and then the next thing, the right, again, you knocked out five giants. One blow from one hand, five giants, all of them together in that whole deal. And when, it, when, the, when, when you got through in the dream, you held up your gloves, and you said, in the, and I heard the Lord speak and said, in this hour that you live in right now, you've got to wear these gloves to win. And he said, I looked on the gloves, and one of them said evergreen, and one of them said everlast. He said, I had an idea of what the everlast was. He said, because I remember that God called, that Abraham called God in this covenant relationship. It says he called God, called on the name of God. That name of God is Olam El. Olam El means everlasting God. Everlasting God. I want you to know something. God doesn't go in and out. He doesn't leave you and then come back. Can I tell you, the Holy Spirit's been here the whole time. He's in your deepest trouble, in your deepest trial, in your deepest sin. He, he said, Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And hear this right now. He was with you before you were ever born, and he'll be with you after you leave this world. God says, I'm the everlasting God. The everlasting God. He is the God of covenant. And he said, what I've started, I'm going to bring to completion. And hear this. When we talk about everlasting, we have a hard time with it because we have a time mindset. Everlasting has no time limits because God lives outside of time. God says, before time was, I was, and you were. And after time ends, I will, and you will. I want you to know right now, God hadn't forgot us in this generation. He hadn't forgot you in your troubles. Why? Because he's the everlasting God. He's always with us. And there's something about this everlasting God who makes covenant. Jesus said this. In John chapter 17, verse 3, he says, He says, this is eternal life. What's eternal life? This is eternal life. To know the one and true living God and His Son, Jesus Christ. You know what eternal life is? Eternal life is not saying a prayer. Eternal life is not just coming and being baptized in water. Eternal life is to know God and to know His Son. God hasn't sent here, us here to have a theology. He is here. He, he has sent us here to have an experience with God. God wants us to know Him. One of my constant prayers that's been the prayer of my life is, I want to know Him and the power of His resurrection. I want you to know right now that God doesn't want us to just know about Him. He wants us to know Him. In the book of Daniel, it said in the latter times. Oh, this is the last day. In the latter times, okay. In the latter times, those that know their God will do great exploits. I want to tell you something. I'm not looking for the little stuff. I'm looking for the big stuff. Because what? God says, I'm going to knock out the giants with this. Then I'll always be with you. And this person that's always with you will always see that you triumph no matter what's going on. So he said, I had that glove. I knew what that meant. And I knew what God was talking about in that eternal past that he went back and he's forgiven us and he's changed and transformed us. And he's got a purpose and a plan and a destiny for Caitlin and for you in our future. God has something for us. Why? Because he's an eternal God. He said six more years would pass and I would be asking God the whole time, okay, that's one glove. What does the other one mean? And he said, the answer to that one came in graduation again when I went back to the college, and this time I didn't speak. I was going to have an outside speaker, one that actually graduated from the school, and his name was Bill. Again, he did not give his last name, but Bill was one of my spiritual sons. And I asked Bill to come because I wanted those students to see Bill was not a preacher. Bill was a military officer, and he said he was of high rank. He, he said not only he was a, a military officer that came from uh, the special forces. And not only from the special forces, the elite of the elite, the meanest of the mean in the whole deal, but he also became a JAG lawyer after that and very successful in what he did. And he said he came to speak. And he spake, spoke to those, children, those young people and he told them, he says, you don't have to be a preacher. You don't, you don't have to, you can be a military guy. You can take Christ wherever you go. Just think about this. The government will pay your way. And you can be a missionary wherever you go. I want you to realize right now, God's not looking just for preachers. He's not just looking for missionaries. He's looking for doctors and lawyers. He's looking for people that are politicians that will change this nation. And God has called every one of us to that. As he was speaking to that, he wound down in his message. And Dutch says, and then he gave me a big surprise. 
He looked at me and he says, Papa Dutch, he said, I brought a gift for you today. God told me to bring this gift to you. He says, I, I become a student of American history. And he said, one of our first flags, what really the very, one of the very first flags that we ever had was this flag. And I want you to have it today. And on this flag, he, he went down and he brought this flag right here. It's called the Appeal to Heaven. Many of you have ordered these. If you haven't, you ought to order one and have it. I fly at my house. And what it was, it was one of the first flags that the United States ever had, and it was commissioned by George Washington. And George Washington was not the president at the time. He, he was the general and the commander, and we had no navy. So they built two or three navy ships, and this was the flag that flew on the navy ships. And the reason was they were appealing to heaven because they knew that they were facing the greatest power on earth and that they were no match for this. And if they were going to win this war, that the war had to be won because God was on their side. Are you listening to me? The only way we're going to win this war is if God's on our side. And if God's on our side, nobody can stand against us. And they knew that. And on this, it was, he was describing it. And Dutch is sitting in the audience, and he said, my mouth fell open because I realized what he said. He said, uh, he said to him, uh, was, that she, what, was that flag white? He said, yeah. And he said, did it have a green tree on it? He said, yeah, it had a green tree on it. And did it have what? Appeal to heaven? Yes, it had all. How would you know that? He said, because God showed it to me long ago. And he showed me that that was the flag that the uh, prayer movement was to fly under and that, that God would use it in a power and a great way. And so, that. and he went on to say his, uh, his and, and the flag actually came from a thought that was given to Benjamin Franklin, our founding father, one of, one of our founding fathers. And ben, Benjamin Frank, Franklin, excuse me, Love the chorus uh, tribe, a, cor a chorus tribe, yeah, in that. I'm trying to get where I'm at. A uh, quarry tribe, in that. And this tribe was well known in, in America at the time. And uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin picked it up for the reason was that uh, this tribe, these tribes had come together. There were five nation tribes. And those five nation tribes were united by a king. A, a, a leader, a chief. And, the, and they came together, all five of them, to form one nation. I, I thought it very interesting that uh, when I used to go a lot, he hadn't had it lately, is uh, Lynn Howes has a conference that he has uh, in uh, Berkeley Springs, West Virginia. And up there, he's had a speaker at times, and I've talked to him, sat down and talked to him, and whatever. He is the chief of the tribe of six nations. And he is up there. And he is not only the tribal leader, but he is the chief, and he is a preacher. And I'm telling you, he is a powerful, anointed preacher. I want you to know right now that Benjamin Franklin looked at this, and these were tribes that were at war with one another, and they came and they reconciled, and they had peace. And how did they do it? He said the chief brought an evergreen tree out, like you see there. They had an evergreen tree. And as they brought the evergreen tree out, they invited all the tribe's chiefs to come forward and all the warriors that came and they buried all of their weapons under this green tree. And the green tree became the tree of peace. Are you listening to me? The tree of peace. And Benjamin Franklin took that up and he started writing articles and he says, if Indians can come together Five or six nations come together and form one nation. Why cannot 13 colonies come together under God and say under a flag to appeal to heaven and we cannot appeal to heaven and have the same type of unity together? And that's exactly what took place. George Washington took up on it and he made a flag of it. And the flag flew over our navy, our first navy. It flew over that. Why? It was a reminder that it was God who gave us peace. And that peace came from a tree. You know where that tree comes from? It comes from the cross of Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 3 reminds us that he was crucified on a tree. And what? He that knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It said he became a curse for us that we might receive the blessings of God. It became a tree of what? Peace. The cross 
became a tree of peace. Not of violence, not of destruction, but of peace. Can I tell you right now, the only thing that's going to bring peace in our nation, peace among people, is when we all come to the foot of the cross and we realize it was the same blood that saved all of us. And none of us are perfect. But God of the everlasting God has put our sins in the past and He said, I will never remember them again. And this will be the sign to you. This tree from all generations will be a sign to you that I have forgiven your sins. I remind you that before Jesus went to the cross, that he sat with his disciples and he says, I'm about to go to die and I'm going to die on a cross for you. And he stood that night and he took a cup and that cup is called a cup of covenant. And he said, this is the new covenant in my blood that I shed for you. I want to tell you, we have a covenant of forgiveness, a covenant of transformation that God has promised us peace. And can I tell you, it will not only be for us, it will not only be for Open Door Church, it will not only be for our nation, but it'll be for the world. God is calling us to a time of peace and transformation. And it is only God that can do that. And then Dutch Sheets was reminded of something else. He was reminded of this passage in the book of Genesis chapter 21 that I just read to you right there. And, it, and the Bible says that when Abraham made covenant and he opened up a well, there was a fountain opened at Calvary. When he opened up a well and he made covenant, the Bible says he planted a tarmosh tree. Do you know what a tarmosh tree is? an evergreen tree. He planted an evergreen tree. Hear this right now. No, Dutch was talking about that. People say nobody ever plants an evergreen tree for themselves. They grow true slow. The person who planted it would never see it come to fullness, never come to see maturity. Can I tell you, our Lord Jesus Christ planted a tree 2,000 years ago. He didn't get to see it come to fullness then, but it's coming to fullness now. There was a tree planted in this nation 250 years ago. It hadn't come to completion now, but it's coming to completion. And God says, what I started, I'll bring to completion. I believe it's coming in our day. I believe it's coming in our time. I believe this election has great things to do with it. And I believe what's happening in this nation has great things to do with it. That we're going to see things we have never seen before. Why? Why? Because God's not through with his dream. He had a dream of a nation. A nation that would what? A nation that would serve him. And a nation that would send freedom around the world. I thought it was interesting this morning. I, I think it's a great reminder. That Linda talked about Russia. I want to tell you, sorry, help me, Lord. I want to get a hold of some of these yahoos that do all this prote protest and don't ever work in their life, can't get a job, don't want a job in the whole thing, and they think this is the worst country in the world. Can I tell you, I've been to some of the worst countries in this world. Russia has been one of them. And I remember to go in there and share the gospel, and I've said this before. I remember one of the first time I was there, I'm standing in a school. It used to be an old comedy school. They even got a thing up there that's showing what to do when America attacks you and you've got to go to your bomb shelter. And that, uh, it was behind me on the thing right there. And I stood before them, and, and the nation is broke. You're spending your children's inheritance. The nation was broke. Money was worthless. They were starving just like they're doing now. Didn't have anything on the shelves and the whole deal. And I stood before them, and I was standing before young people. But listen... Not just young people. They, they weren't protesting. They were young people that were scientists. Scientists. They were lo young people that were doctors and lawyers, uh, the, musicians, singers. They were the smartest people I believe I've ever seen in my life. And I stood before them and it really came on me and I said, I want to tell you something right now. I'm not here telling you I'm smarter than you or I'm better than you because I come from America. I'm telling you I'm bringing you two things that I have, that I want to leave with you before I leave. And those two things are this right here. First of all, something that we have that we take for granted, I want to leave freedom with you. I want to leave freedom with you. And the second thing is, I want to leave, leave Jesus with you. Those two things I have, those two things we have in America, we have freedom of religion at one time. We have all of those things, and I want to see those in this country. And when it happens, it'll change it. And it did change it. It changed the nation. But just like now, they forgot where they came from. And they wanted to go back to where they were. Can I tell you, God says we're not going back. We're going over. 
He's calling us to remember our inheritance and remember our roots. And listen, whether you believe it or not, God is able to save. God is able to save America. He's able to save this nation. Jeremiah 6, 16. God speaks to Jeremiah and he says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where the good way is, and walk in it, and then you will find rest for your soul. God says, I'm going to restore this nation. I'm going to restore what you had in the past. I'm going to restore your faithfulness and your godliness. I'm going to restore your leaders, and they will lead you into righteousness and holiness. And that's what I'm looking for. Listen to me. Are you Republican or Democrat? Can I, they had another dream my prophet had, and I'm, I'm agreeing with that dream. Uh, uh, Greg Hood. I had a dream, and he, and he said the Lord gave him a dream, and I'm not going into the dream, uh, take too long or whatever. But in reality, the dream was saying that God is fixed to tear up and destroy the Democratic Party. And after he gets through with that, he's going to tear up and destroy the Republican Party. And I say, Amen. Yeah. I want some righteous leaders. I don't want you in a party. I want you to serve God. I want you to serve this nation, and I want you to serve God's people. And that's what we've got to be called to. And that's what God's calling this nation to right now. There is a transformation that has started, and it will be completed. God says, what I've started, I will carry on to completion. Yes. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Being confident in this, that he that began a good work in you will carry it on to the day of completion in Christ Jesus. I believe that. Now I'm going to close with this. There's one more dream that uh, he had. This won't be long. One more dream. And Dutch said, I had another friend whose name was Rick. I like that friend. And he said, Rick had a dream. And Rick came to me and he says, Dutch, I had a dream about you. And he said, me and you were in a dream again. And uh, a different guy. And he said, in the dream, we came to an old tabernacle. I want you to know, in the Great Awakening, even, even after that, it's the second great awakening. They used tabernacles. They built things in the woods with a tabernacle and a roof over it, and that's where they worshiped God. And a great revival took place in all this nation. And he said, we came to a great tabernacle, this real old tabernacle. And he said, an old man came walking up, and the old man came up to us, and he said, I want to show you the tabernacle. And he said he went inside, he turned on the lights. I'm going quick. He went the dream. He turned on the lights and light came into the tabernacle. And as he looked around, he could see. He says, this is the biggest tabernacle I've ever seen. It, had, it would held 25 or 35,000 people. And he said the, the windows were shuttered. And he says, I want you to go and open the shutters. And if we open the shutters, he says, I want you to come and stand on the stage. And he says, we stood on the stage. He said, look out the window. And when he looked out the window, he said he saw pilgrims coming. And they were coming on ships. And they came in and they got off the ships and they came marching in and they came marching into the arena and they took their place in the arena and they started praising God and worshiping God and one of their leaders stood up and he prophesied of a great nation that was coming and a transformation it would be for the world. And he said, then they sat down. And he said, after them, pioneers came and they came in their, their wagons. They came all over from every place. And another great crowd came in and they were cheering and they came in and they, they were worshiping God and their leader got up and they started prophesying over the nation that we would be pioneers around the world, take the gospel around the world. And they, stand, they sat and took their place. And then the planters came. Those that built this nation and started the industries and started the churches and built all the structures that we have today. And they came in and they marched in and they also had a leader. And he got up there and prophesied and they sang and they worshiped God. This went on for six generations. And all six were in there. And the whole place was shouting and screaming. And then the old man looked over at, at, at Dutch and he says, and now it's your time. It's your generation's time. And he says, will you take your place? And he said about that time, automobiles started rolling in and people from this generation came walking through the doors and they were worshiping and praising God. And he says, and I took the stage as the leader. And he said, when I took the stage as the leader, I took this flag. And he said, I got on the stage as the leader and as I got on the stage, and I'm going to be out of this and no matter what I do in the whole deal. He said, I started not just waving the flag, not just holding the flag, but he says, I started waving the flag in a motion of eight. You know what eight means? Eight is the number of covenants. God says, I'm remembering my covenant 
with America. I'm remembering when I started out with this nation that you appeal to heaven. And I'm bringing up a generation that's going to appeal to heaven again. And I'm going to listen to their appeal. And I'm going to change and I'm going to save their land. Can I tell you we're living in that time right now? And I'm going to tell you, I'm prophesying to you, this place will be filled up again. That church on the hill will be filled up again. And people will seek God again. And they will turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not because of our great power. Not because of our great luxuries or all the technology we've got. But because of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's going to bring life back to His church and back to His nation. That's what I look for. When I saw and I experienced this on uh, Pastor's Appreciation Sunday and I saw these gloves. Immediately it came to mind. God, that's what you're going to say. But it's not for next week. It's a time. This is the Sunday before election. This is the time. And I'm going to tell you, there are red gloves. And we're going to knock out the giants. This nation is going to be ours again. It's going to be God's again. And I believe that. I want to say to you that are watching me online, the most important thing in your life is to know Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing. Oh, well, I just need to vote right. No, you need to know Him. He is the eternal God. And that's what eternal means. It means to know the Father and to know the Son. Next thing, you need to vote. And you need to pray for godly leaders. Listen, don't, don't get satisfied and say, well, it's all over Tuesday. No matter what happens, it's all over Tuesday. No, it's not. It's only beginning. We've got to have a people... Or in a taste, they, they, they just said, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give up. No matter what, I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to tell you, our leaders need our prayers more than ever before, and especially godly leaders. They're stepping into one of the most ungodly generations that we've ever known, and only God can turn it. And they must see leaders. They must see leaders that not only profess they're Christians, but they live out their Christian life. God has called to that. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins and heal their land. Bow your heads. Father, I just praise you for this morning. I thank you, Lord, for generations that are standing up, that are coming behind us, that we're so excited about. Father, I thank you for this nation. I've had the privilege for 72 years to live in the greatest nation on earth. And God, it is a Christian nation no matter what a president said. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you have raised us up for Christ. And Father, that our greatness comes from knowing you. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord, for restoring it, not only in our politics, but, Father, restoring it in our hearts. And Father, right now that you turn us toward this Christ, and there will be such a transformation that it will be amazing to the world. Lord, we release that right now, and I thank you ahead of time for what you have accomplished, what you will do, what you have done. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you will save America, and that you will save us, and that you will save our children and our families. And Lord, you'll save the world. That this guy right here, who started out many years ago going to Russia, will get an opportunity to go again and proclaim to the gospel to even a new generation. Father, I thank you, Lord. You're a God of faithfulness, and we praise you. And thank you for that faithfulness right now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Remember to use your gloves. Knock them giants out, okay? Keep praying. Keep believing. God's doing great things.